Let's worship him this morning, the risen Savior. I 
close our eyes for just a minute. And thank you for the resurrection. about six hours on a Friday Jesus hung on a cross and all the sin of the world every sin for all time was placed on him see this was the darkest moment history and the sky turned black and before he died Jesus said it is accomplished meaning it is finished meaning the thing I came here to do is done and he was dead you see and he was buried in a tomb. And the devil thought he had won. And death thought he had won. But very early on a Sunday morning, come on somebody, very early on a Sunday morning, that stone rolled away. He walked out of that grave. And he was holding some keys. You might remember the keys? Death and hell and the grave. And they hold no power over you anymore because of what he did. about 60 seconds and thank him for the resurrection right now. Come on somebody, let's make some noise.
like me. tomb and the angels said who are you looking for and they said we're looking for Jesus and he said why are you looking in a grave for someone who's alive why are you looking for the living among the dead see he's not in the grave anymore he's not in the grave anymore He's a risen Savior, and He's here today. Make no mistake, He's here today. He is present with us today. Jesus, we just recognize Your presence here. We thank You that it has been accomplished, and the victory is won. And the curse is lifted. And the debt is paid. Thank you, God. And my sin is forgiven. Because you died and rose again. Oh. May I never cease to be amazed. That's your mercy, that's your grace, God. I pray that your will be done, your name be glorified through us. We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Somebody give him a shout before you sit down. that we call our tithes and offerings. And so if you're new here, uh, we have three easy, convenient ways that you can give this morning, whether it's on fotune.org, through our text mobile giving, or through the envelope that is sitting in front of you. And so however you're giving this morning, we just want to encourage you and remind you to be faithful and obedient and a good steward of all that the Lord has entrusted you to. So as you're preparing that gift, um, let's go ahead and pray as we offer this to the Lord. So God, we thank you so much, Lord, that celebrating a risen Savior isn't a once-a-year occasion, Lord, but it is a daily reality that we get to live in, Lord. And so, Father, as you're doing um, a new work in, the, in us this morning, God, I pray that you would move our hearts in a posture, Lord, that is compelled and uh, expectant and excited to give back to you, Lord. We recognize you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and so that means you're a King and Lord over our finances. And so I pray that we would sow accordingly, Lord. We thank you, God, for the eternal investment um, that those are making this morning, God. And I pray that you would stretch our faith and that we would trust you wholeheartedly, not just when it's convenient, Lord, but because we understand it is necessary and that there's nothing more important, Lord. And so we bless this congregation. We thank you for this house of freedom. And uh, we say we are so expectant for what it is you want to do in and through us this morning, Lord. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here today at Fellowship of the Nations. Here's what's coming up. The Easter egg hunt will happen immediately following the service today. So be sure to make your way straight out to the field as soon as we close in prayer. Hey fellas, the annual Iron Man Wall Game Dinner is tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. If you've never been, you don't know what you're missing. There will be amazing food, great fellowship, door prizes, and a special guest. 
So sign up at the table in the foyer for what food you will bring to share with the guys, if you're man enough. The Sports with the Nation's Golf Tournament is May the 2nd at River Terrace in Channel View. So get signed up at the table out front or ask Pastor Johnny for more information. All the proceeds go to the Panama Mission Trip in June. If you're in need of deliverance and inner healing, you'll want to attend the Sozo Teaching with prayer leader Mirna Valdez each Wednesday night at 7 p.m. upstairs. The cost of the workbook is $12 and the series is a four month commitment. Student Nation is going to Camp Fuego in Louisiana this July the 8th through the 12th. The cost is $235, so get signed up today with Pastor Stephanie to get on a payment plan so you don't miss this life-changing event. Now everybody, go out and have a great week. got seated, but is it okay since it is Easter and is the greatest day ever in the history of mankind? Can we just stand up and give Jesus a big standing ovation? Come on. Yes, yes, and the people said, amen. amen, all right, sit down if you can, what a great day, Woo! <clears throat> are you glad you're here, yeah. amen, 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 good to see everybody, man, some of you all dressed up, looking good, if you're here for the first time, we greet you in the name of Jesus, thank you so much for being our guest today, we are just a Jesus church, we're a multi-denominational fellowship, we're not really concerned about what label that you have, you could be a Baptist or Catholic or Methodist or whatever, and none of that really matters because we are preaching Jesus, and uh, it's when we get to heaven, there's not going to be any denominations up there, we're just the redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, amen? And so, uh, so that's who we do. He's the pastor of our church. He's our leader. We're just following him. So uh, thank you for joining in with us. Uh, we do want to give a big old welcome to our online congregation. Good morning, guys. <laughs> and uh, we are so happy to announce that while we are meeting here, we have our Fellowship of the Nations campus that is now uh, operating in Monterey, Mexico with Pastor Alfredo Perales. Amen. 
And then uh, we also have our, uh, our campus, a church that's in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, so it's Fellowship of the Nations, Cambodia, so that's also meeting as well. So we're very excited about that. And uh, amen. And I want to I show you, I don't know if we got these, uh, these videos, but we have our second uh, campus, our second church that is uh, being built. And so thanks to you, I don't know if we got those, those pictures. Anyway, yes, no, no, okay. Huh? Can you find them? I bet you can. Anyway, so while we're doing it, it's, it's really exciting because right now we have being built uh, our Fellowship of the Nations Church that is in West Bengal, India, and, uh, and then the second church that is being built in, uh, there we go, there we go, this land was donated, and so the villagers are there, and so this is the equipment, the, the, the materials that are there, and I think there's maybe one more picture. So that has been purchased by you. You're the ones because of your faithfulness, and uh, we're seeing that our second church, and let me tell you, it's not like one of the churches in America. What happened is uh, they went into Phnom Penh into the, the poor areas, and they uh, gave them about 30 minutes to uh, get their belongings, and they live in shanties, little, little broken-down homes, and they let them, made them put their stuff in a truck. They took them out about 40, 50 kilometers, dropped them off in fields, gave them blue tarps, and so they have all of these villages of people out in the middle of remote areas, and so they need churches. Well, guess what? We have two. This is the second one being built, and God willing, we're going to have a third one be, going to be built in about two months uh, after that. So we're going to be headed to Cambodia uh, right there, actually, in uh, next month. And so we're just believing that we're going to get to dedicate that. So on behalf of you, Fellowship of the Nations, and so that'll be our, our second campus there. So we're very excited about what God is doing around the world. Amen? So he's doing it through you. So to God be the glory. Amen. Anybody got the word? Word up. Hold it in the air like you really, really care. Say it together. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. It is a lamp to my feet, a light into my path. I will hide his word in my heart so that I might not sin against God. Holy Spirit, Give me ears to hear and strength to obey in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Well, we are so excited about Easter, so excited about what God is doing. I do want to give you a, a couple of reminders real quick before we start. And that is, we've had a number of people saved over the last several months. If that is you, we want to ask that you would pray about two things. One, the second Sunday of the month, we have baptism. We want, to, want you to follow in believers' baptism. Baptism does not save you. It's just an outward testimony of what Jesus Christ has already done on the inside. That's the first thing. Second thing is, we would like for you to get involved in our Sozo class. That's four months, and it's, it's all about inner healing. It's, it'll help you understand maybe why you struggle with some things that you struggle with, and uh, Mirna is right here. She's teaching that powerful, powerful teaching. So it's on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, so just come and get in on that. So once you grow, well, not just to come and say a prayer to say, I want to follow Jesus, but actually equip you to follow. Does that make sense? All right. Well, everybody good? Yes? All right, hopefully you got your photo booth. Let me say a big thank you to uh, several people, uh, Shane, Lisa, Sheila, different ones, for the photo booth and uh, all the people who made cookies and coffee and all those things that you got to enjoy. So thank you so much. And uh, good job. Good job. And uh, just a reminder, let me have all the men, just raise your hand, men. Mighty men to see you. All right. We have something for you. That's tomorrow night. We have our wild game dinner. We want you to come. Uh, I think we're going to have plenty of food. And so uh, if, we, we've got, if you don't like wild meat, it's okay. We've got chicken and steaks and, and barbecue and all that kind of stuff too. So anyway, we want you to come. 7 o'clock, we'll be right there in the fellowship hall. Got a fish fry going. We got all kinds of things happening. So come on and get in involved in it. Well, hey, has anybody ever had a bad day? Uh, you, you had a bad one, you know, w wish you could do it over, you know, had a do-over, 
All right, for us golfers, a mulligan. <laughs> my best shot carries a mulligan. You know, I just keep that second ball in my pocket so I can just drop it and try to hit another one. Uh, anyway, listen, we've all had bad days. We, had, we have done things that we regret, wish that we could, you know, have a do-over, wish we could, you know, take it back, maybe things that we said, things that we've done, and we're like, regret some things. This was how it was with Jesus' disciples. And this is what I want to focus on this morning. Because we need, at times, a fresh start. We need a do-over. We, we need a mulligan. And so I want us to take a look, just for a little bit, through the eyes of Peter. He was a disciple. seemed like he was the one who talked the most and uh, always kind of put his foot in his mouth sometimes. But God still used him. But as we look here, it's, uh, let's take it really from the part whenever he was um, coming up. They had just had the triumphal ent entry of Jesus. They had been with him for three and a half years, and while they were, while they were with him, now they, they're, they're coming in, and they had this triumphal entry, man. I mean, it was a popular moment. All the crowd was there. They were coming along, and man, all of a sudden, we just had, had all these people with palm branches, and they're singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, and man, just having a great, great time. Well, they thought, well, man, Jesus is more popular than ever. Not a problem, right? But here's what happens. They got familiar. See, familiarity breeds contempt. And so now we come to the time where it is, you know, they're going up and they're going to have the, the, uh, the, the supper for the Passover. They're going to celebrate all of that. And so when, when it came to that time, what we see is, is these guys just walk up to the upper room. Now, the custom was that when you, when you go to the, into a house back then, because their feet were dirty, they were wearing sandals, they would come in, take off their sandals, and then they would wash their feet. Well, certainly the servants of Jesus, disciples of Jesus would wash the servant's feet, the master's feet, right? No, they didn't do that. They forgot about it. And it wasn't until that they were already eaten, their bellies were full, and then Jesus takes off his robe and begins to wash their feet. Embarrassing. Matter of fact, Peter kind of mouthed off. He said, well, okay, if you're going to wash my feet, we'll just wash my whole body, right? He was just, you know, he was, he was embarrassed. So, you know, mistake number one. You know, they're like, oh, we forgot to wash the master's feet. So that's, that's not too good. Then, in the middle of that, Jesus says, oh, by the way, one of you guys, you're going to betray me. Wait a minute. Who? And they start looking around. That's another. That's a bad day. Wait a minute. We've been together for three and a half years. What do you mean? One of these guys in here is going to betray Jesus? That's not cool. Who is it? Right? And then... After they're there, they, they leave, and Jesus says, let's go out to the garden because I want to pray. Will you pray with me at least an hour? Can you hang out with me for an hour? Now, you would think Jesus had 12 guys. They would surround him. They'd put a perimeter, you know, and they'd be watching, you know, watch and pray, right? And so they'd be, they'd be watching Jesus be in the middle, and here they are. Oh, no, no, no. They just all clumped up together, went to sleep. Jesus goes off and prays. He comes back a little later. They're asleep. He said, man, can't you pray with me an hour? Oh, yeah. Oh, Jesus, yeah, we'll pray, we'll pray. And what do they do? He goes off and prays again. They fall back asleep, right? And when the crowd comes and the soldiers come to arrest Jesus, what do they do? They suddenly wake up. They weren't on guard. Another bad experience. Man, we just let, let him down. We weren't watching. We weren't praying. You know, another bad day. And so Peter, again, as he's, instead of mouthing off, he pulls out his sword, and he cuts off the servant's ear. He didn't go for the biggest and baddest. He went for the youngest and smallest. Probably, okay, I'll get somebody here. Chopped his ear off. You know, and Jesus goes, no, no, we don't, we don't operate like that. Picked up the ear, put it back on, it was healed. Right? Amazing how that happens. But in the process, the disciples, none of them flee. One of them betrays. And then from a distance, two of them follow, Peter and John. So here they are. They're making their way, and they've got the crowd, and they're going to see, well, who, where are they staying? Where are they going? What are they doing with him? And now they set up a, a kangaroo court at Caiaphas' house, the, the high priest, and they, they have, a, have a moment there where they're, they're looking in, and John's able to get in, and then he makes a way for Peter to get in. But see, what happened is right before that, Jesus had already told Peter, listen, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to de deny me three times. Oh, here he goes, mouthing off again, not me, Lord. Man, I'll go to prison with you. I'll die with you, man, whatever. I got your back. 
No, he didn't have his back. A little servant girl comes along and says, hey, aren't you the one that was with him? You look like one of those guys from one of them country boys, one of them fishermen or something. I, no, 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 not me. I, I don't even know him. Three times he denies him. And what we find is Peter, when the rooster crows, looks over and catches the eyes of Jesus, runs out, and he weeps bitterly. Ever had a bad day? I would say Peter was having a very, very bad day. The man who walked on water towards Jesus is now running away because some little servant girl was coming after him. Well, this was part of it. We all have bad days. We all need a fresh start in our lives. And see, when we look at Jesus, the reason why it's not just Easter where we can come and eat some cookies, drink some coffee, wear some nice clothes, and, and have an Easter egg hunt and take a picture in the photo booth, you know, and, and go and, and, and have a good time as a family. This is the greatest event in history. This one. Why? Because we all have bad days. We all have bad times. We've all had experiences and seasons in our life where we totally have blown it. We had periods where we, we're not even sure if we even believe in a God. We have seasons where we're not sure because something happens. Well, God, how can that happen? If you had let that happen, then I don't even believe that you love me. Seasons in our lives where we question God's existence or maybe our purpose for living. Do I even need to live? We have questions where we've been so depressed and we listen to the lies of the enemy and we're thinking, certainly this is it for me. And Jesus says, Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. I have something better for you. I want to go in. I want to do something better for you. And what made matters worse for them is the religious leaders and the, and the Roman government were against them as well. If there was a liberal media back then, they, they would have had Jesus on, on, on the news all the time. Well, we don't know what this guy's doing, but he just fed 5,000 people with three loaves and some fish, and, 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 and we just don't believe that he's God. You know, and it also occurs that he raised people from the dead and... Uh, yeah, but we just don't believe that's going to happen either. It's probably he was in a coma or something. There's, it's certainly not true for that. You know, liberal media can, can come up against, you know, anybody can come and say and, and make you try to doubt the existence of God. And see, the Roman government, that's what they did. The religious leaders, those that were jealous of Jesus, those who had religion but they didn't have a relationship, those who, who had, had memorized Scripture but they knew not the power of it, this these guys were the ones that are saying, hey, let's get him. And so they talk Judas into betraying him for 30 pieces of silver. And they go, and Judas betrays him with, a, with a, a kiss. And we see Jesus, he goes through the whole process, the kangaroo court, this man who was innocent. And what we see is they trumped up charges against him. Oh, this man said he can tear down the temple and, and, and build it up in three days. Of course, he was talking about his own body and his resurrection. And now... They come and they slap him on the face. They beat him. They, they hit him with rods. They blindfold him. They pluck his beard. They do all of those things. They take him out and they beat him with a whip called the cat of nine tails. Nine tails on a whip with, with metal and bone and glass on the end of it that would sink into a human's flesh and rip it to shreds. That is what they wanted to do to our Savior. That is the one, what he w went through and what he endured so that we could get through our bad days to a good day. That's why. See, Jesus wanted it to be very, very practical because when, when it comes to a relationship, we see of all the disciples, only one made it to the cross. Only one, not, and it wasn't Peter. It was John. He made it to the cross with, with the mother of, of Jesus, with Mary self. Don't you ever, ever wonder where the other ten were? Were they hiding? Were they in the back alleys? You know, were they, were they, were they peeking and trying to look at Golgotha the hill where they, they crucified him, where the three crosses were? Were they, were they looking, is that really Jesus? Is he, is he really going to die? Or were they in a room that was locked because they were afraid? They spent time looking down at the feet that was just washed by their Savior. See, they all had some bad days, two and a half days of, of really a lot of regret, a lot of confusion, a lot of fear. Well, this is what we see. But we can relate. How did, how did they feel? Well, I'm sure they felt worthless and ashamed, and they felt like they were failures. 
Don't you wonder what, what Peter was thinking? He said, man, I went three and a half years with this guy, and now I denied him. I wonder what the punishment of that's going to be. I wonder if my heavenly father, heavenly father, is he going to deny me because I denied his son? All of those questions can be in our minds because when you blow it, what, is, what does the enemy say to you? And you call yourself a Christian? And you say you love Jesus? It's the same devil, same lies, all of the things that go through. Well, here's, here's the truth. See, we've all denied Jesus. We can relate, all right? Look what the Isaiah 53, 6 says. It says, we all like sheep, we have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. So when we look at that, let me, let me just, just remind you, when you're sitting here in, in this service, there's no judgment here. There's no judgment. You know why? Because we all have sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. Right? So nobody points fingers here. We, we just come to the Lord and we say, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you. Amen? That, that's, that's why we invite you to come because you're just, just like us. We're, we're in, in the same situation. So here it is. Here's, here's Peter. And we have to ask ourselves, when we look at his life, are we a lot like him? You see, we can find ourselves seeking something that really isn't for our best. Let me give you an example. A lot of those guys, I'm sure, they thought with well, Jesus, he's, he's the king. He's going to set up a kingdom. I mean, we got a dream. I mean, we may be some unlearned or idiot fishermen, as the true word is. You know, they said, if, if we're going to be fishermen, we're going to follow this guy. He's going to set up a kingdom. We're going to be part of the kingdom. Matter of fact, the mother of James and John, she even pulled Jesus aside and said, listen, when you come into your kingdom, uh, if you don't mind, put some thrones on both sides for my sons. They had, they had big ideas of what was getting ready to come, right? Their dreams got crushed. Anybody ever have your dreams crushed? Set some goals and you didn't make them? Huh? Wish for something that didn't happen. Maybe a marriage that was there and it failed. Maybe something, you know, you wanted that job and you got to a certain point and then they let you go. Dreams crushed. But this is why Jesus came. Because he has a purpose for you. He got something bigger. I was reading a story about Tom Brady. Tom Brady, he's not my cousin. I've been asked. He's not. <laughs> but he is the quarterback of New England Patriots. This is after he had won his third Super Bowl. And he was on 60 Minutes, and they did an interview. And, uh, and he said in his interview, he said, why do I, I have three Super Bowl rings, and I still think that there is something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what life is all about, reaching your goals, your dreams. For me, I think, God, there's got to be more to life than this. And now he won his sixth, but probably feels the same way. Because if you put all your eggs in a basket and you see that it's not going to fulfill your life, no matter how much money you may make, no matter how, much, how many toys you may have, how big your house is, it doesn't matter what it is because there's something even deeper. Let's look at, at Tony Dungy. Tony Dungy, he was the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts. They won the Super Bowl in 2007. Here's his interview. He said, the Super Bowl was great, but it's not the greatest. My focus over the two weeks leading up to the Super Bowl was Matthew 16, 26. And was Jesus asked, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but you lose your soul? He said, our guys could gain all the accolades and success of this world yet lose touch with their priorities, their principles, and then the God who loves them. He said, I love coaching and winning the Super Bowl was a goal that I'd had for a long time, but it was never, has never been my purpose in life. My purpose in life is simply to glorify God. Amen. You see the difference? You had two different Super Bowl winners. One felt empty. One felt fulfilled. Why? Because it was just a goal and it wasn't his purpose. You have to ask yourself, what really is my purpose in our life? All right, we follow in our own way. If we do our own thing, what it does, it ends up when we close our, when we close our eyes at night. Listen to me. This is where the rubber meets the road in our lives. 
We can go through a busy day and we can be around a lot of people. You know, maybe you think, oh, this is successful and this is happening. But when you get in the bed and you close your eyes at night and you really begin to think, what is life all about? Is this all there is? And let me tell you, there is so much more when you encounter Jesus Christ. Because God created every single one of you with a purpose. God designed you in your mother's womb. He has a purpose for you. He loves you more than anybody else on this planet. And he said, I created you for a reason. And you're not going to find fulfillment. You're not going to find peace until you find me. And it's a relationship. Not religion. But it's a day-to-day relationship. I talked to a gentleman the other day at a store. And, uh, you know, I was just had to witness to him a little bit. And uh, I said, hey, are, have you connected with Jesus? He goes, well, I'm, I'm a Catholic, which probably the majority of the people in here are Catholics. All right. But he said, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a Catholic. I'm not sure I'm a Christian, but I'm a, I'm a Catholic. I said, okay. I said, but have you ever met Jesus? Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I, I've been to church. I said, yeah. I said, let me, let me give you the, the testimony of the people in our church. And I shared some of the testimonies that you share with me. I said, you know, we have those in our church. They, they were grown up. They, they grew up Catholic and, you know, were in church. But this is what they told me. They said, we had religion. We had the traditions of man. But now we have a relationship with God. All right. See the difference? He said, he said, I never thought of it that way. I didn't, I didn't realize that you really could have a relationship. I said, oh, yeah. And then I really freaked him out. And I said, oh, by the way, if you think me coming into your furniture store was to buy furniture, I said it wasn't. It was a divine appointment. Because God wanted me to tell you how much he loves you. And that he wants a relationship with you. All right. <clears throat> you, you know what I loved about that? When we got ready to go, he goes, can you give me a hug? <laughs> I said, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Oh, great people. Great people. Listen, I want to tell you this, and we'll go through this quickly. The disciples, did they remain failures? No. No. Were they ashamed of what happened? Yes. But they didn't live under the shame, guilt, and condemnation, right? And God does not want you to do that either. Here's the rest of the story. They became bold, fearless, driven men and women with purpose after they encountered the risen Christ. as an empty tomb. You have your Fridays in life. Every one of us had our Fridays in life. But let me tell you, Sunday's coming. Your Sunday is coming. Matter of fact, your Sunday is here now it's here the greatest event is here we celebrate it now sunday morning look what happened on sunday morning we, it was mentioned a while ago but you had mary magdalene who goes man you why did god pick a woman to be the first one to get the news he just turned the world upside down he turned, turned the religion upside down right because the women weren't even supposed to talk to rabbis they weren't supposed to hang around the, the rabbis no Jesus took a woman who had been demon-possessed and was, was uh, described even as a prostitute, that kind of woman, if he knew what kind of woman she was. And here, she's the one. Why? Because she was transformed. She was forgiven. She was no longer that person. She was a new creature in Christ. That's who it was. So you have the woman coming, coming to her. Then she gets the news and says, go tell them. So here she goes, she runs, she tells them, finds them, and they're, they're all, you know, locked away. They're hiding in a room. They're afraid of everybody. She comes knocking on the door. Hey, listen, hey, got some good news. Jesus has risen. Yeah, all right. No, 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 no. I went to the tomb. The, the stones rolled away. I saw him. I talked to him. He called my name. I'm telling you. Here they go, Peter and John, running. And this is, what I like, this is what I like about John in the Gospel of John. John said, and the two disciples ran, and, and the younger one, the one who is writing, this is what he said, he's describing himself, he, he outran Peter. <laughs> Had to put that note in there, you know. It'll, it'll be for eternity, you know. He's going, well, Pete, <laughs> just want to let you know I outran you. Got there first. 
He runs, he looks in, but then Peter, who is older and wiser, probably a little bit tougher, he, he walks into the tomb. They find it's an empty tomb. It's an empty tomb. What, what does that mean? That means everything that Jesus said, he fulfilled. Every single word of it. He, he told him that he was going to be raised, just like the serpent in the wilderness that Moses raised. He said, the Son of Man has to be raised up. I've got to be crucified. I've got to. And they still didn't listen because they were looking for a temporal kingdom. What happens in life is we miss it because we're looking for something temporal instead of eternal. Don't build your life on things that are just temporal. You've got to focus on the eternal. Matter of fact, that's the only thing that's going to count. What you do, he said, if you're laying up treasure in heaven, that is what's going to be uh, accounted to your, uh, what you have done. These are your works that God will glorify. So we see they were transformed. They were forgiven of their past. Here's what I love about this. Listen to me. If you see the encounter after Jesus, he had already had, had resurrected. He spent 40 days, 40 days there, and he had these encounters. I think he went to his family. You know, he doesn't really say it, but I see G James, who's his, his half-brother, ended up being the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. I think he went, those who didn't believe he grew up with. But now he enters, and he's, he's, uh, he sees the guys fishing. That's what they love to do. They went back doing their same old stuff. So as they're fishing, what does he do? He walks along the seashore, and he goes, hey, guys, have you caught anything? Nope. Been fishing all night. Cast your net on the other side. See, that already happened once. Cast your net on the other side. And all of a sudden, the nets begin to fill up, right? And then they knew, aha. Uh -huh. That's Jesus walking on the shore, right? What does Peter do? Peter just jumps in. He's swimming. He didn't wait for the boat. He just, he just jumped in. He said, man, I go, whew, man, he's doing the backstroke, the butterfly. He's doing all of it, man. You know, I got to get to Jesus, right? But he was uncertain how he would be received. And what I love is this story, this encounter. And I want you to get it because this may be your encounter this morning. Here, Peter had denied him three times, and we all agree that there's probably been times in our life that we have denied Jesus. We were embarrassed, didn't want to let people know that we were Christians, you know, or that we were churchgoers, you know. I mean, the guys at work are telling dirty jokes, and, you know, the, you don't want to be the, the weird one. That's denying Jesus. Hello. But this is how Jesus treats us. He pulled Peter aside, and in private conversation, this is what he said. Hey, Pete, do you love me? Uh, yeah. yeah, Lord, I, I like you. Because he knew if he said he loved me, then you know, he was going to nail him. That's what he thought. He said, feed my sheep. Hey, Pete, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, I, I like you. Feed my sheep. Hey, Pete, do you even like me? Yeah, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. You know what you're saying to the son this morning? Do you love me? I saw what happened last week. I saw what happened last night. And my question is, do you love me? See, that, that comes to the heart of it. That is the heart of relationship. If you have family members or a spouse, and they look you in the eye and say, do you love me? And Jesus is asking that question this morning. And he's not bringing up the past. Not once did he say, hey, Pete, I told you you were going to deny me, and sure enough, you did it. Way to go. Sorry, dog. Here I was, man, in time of need, you know, getting ready to get crucified, and where are you? You run off. He didn't do any of that, did he? And he's not going to do it with you either. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that awesome? That Jesus is coming, and just like he was talking about, he's in the building, he comes to you and says, hey, do you love me? Look how much I love you. But do you love me? 
willing to follow me? Willing to be committed to me? To have a relationship? Can we talk on a daily basis? Can you, can you read my word? Because i got a whole bunch of promises in there. Can you read my word and we can have conversation? Is that possible? See, he's asking that question because it comes to a one-on-one -on -one encounter. It moves it from religion to a personal relationship between you and him. Hey, Pete, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Then do what I created you to do. Don't focus on the past, but let's get focused on the future. God doesn't want you living in the past. He didn't want you focused on your mistakes and my mistakes. He didn't want that. He says, look, you can't change any of that. That is the past. What we want to do is we want to focus on now and the future because I created you for something to do. I created you with purpose. I created you to do something that's eternal, and that is to tell my people, tell people that they can be forgiven, tell people that they can have eternal life. That's what he's talking about. That's the beauty of it. And when we come, we see, and it all comes down really to 1 Peter 1, 3, it says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where our hope is, in the resurrection. That's why we celebrate today. That's why guys are shouting and hollering. Why? Because that's our hope. Resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation, which is Jesus, that is re to be revealed in the last time. This is for every single one of us. This right here. Not a denomination, not a religion, but a relationship. This is where it is. Listen, we're talking about a new birth. One day Jesus was, uh, he was, at night, and, and a religious guy came to him, Nicodemus. He came to him, and he said, hey, good master, what must I do to get into heaven? He said, you must be born again. Born again. He gave him a, a little simple illustration. He said, you're born once of water, right? Well, last Thursday, we got to experience. I mean, we weren't in the room. We were there before and after. But uh, on Thursday morning, uh, we had our fifth grandchild, that was born. All right. Well, uh, you, but you know what? And looking at that beautiful baby boy, I'm just saying. But looking at that boy, you know what? He had nothing to do with it. He was just there. He was given life. He was given purpose. Because God in Psalm 139 said, I knit his members in his mother's womb and I put him together. I put him together with purpose. He didn't have anything to do with that. See, God created you with purpose, in your mother's womb. He gave you a gift. But now that you know him as creator, because you're looking at his creation, you're right here, you see it, but now he goes a little farther. He said, I want you to know me as Lord and Savior. I want you to know me as Savior. That's the question today. Do we really know him? Because see, here's a new birth. It's just a, it's a gift from God. All right, a new birth is only through Jesus. And then we see the resurrection means it's a living hope. And here's where the rubber meets the road. Thursday morning, we were very excited about having a, a new grandson. But Thursday afternoon, we, we, we did the roller coaster of emotion because my dad's youngest brother passed away. So here we were, all excited. But when I called my dad, I said, hey, how are you holding up? You know what he did? He, he quoted John 14. Because see, when you get into tough times like this, and you get into emotional times, what we see is God will give you his promise. God will give you something to stand on. So I'm going to show you my dad's verse. John 14, 1 through 6. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. When you get the news that your brother died, that could be troubling. Then he goes on, it says, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. But, and this is what my dad said, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
My dad said the Lord just came and got him. The Lord just came and got him. I, and as you know the way, I'm going, Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? And here's the key. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Amen. Let me tell you this morning, Jesus is the only way to salvation. He is. He is. This morning, when, when, when we're looking and we're talking about churches that we have, Eddie, Kim, and Tavon, they're in Cambodia. You know what? They're preaching the same message to the Buddhists. And the Buddhists are coming to Jesus because what they had was religion. They want a relationship. We see Dr. Tom Johnson and the scene. They're, in, they're in, uh, in India, and they're preaching to the Hindus the same message. Why? Because they have religion, but they don't have a relationship. They got a religion without any hope. They got a religion with multiple gods, and they don't even know which one to serve. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We see in Mushtag Anjum that we, with our Nation's Bible Institute, we saw a couple weeks ago, they graduated 144 students over there. Well, why, what are they teaching them? They're teaching the Muslims that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. That's what we're teaching. And when it comes down to it, the resurrection is all that matters, how you believe in that right there. Romans 10, 9 and 10, and we we'll close with this verse right here. Look what it says. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God, what? Raised him from the dead, you will what? Be saved. If you miss this point right here, you won't be saved. If you just think, oh, I don't know how anybody can be raised from the dead. You got all these questions? Let me tell you, the contemporaries, the historians who were his contemporaries at that time, they wrote about it. You don't even have to look into the Bible. You can look in the history that was written back then, and they were talking about this very thing of Jesus, and who was hated by the religious people, who was crucified by the Romans, but his tomb was empty. His followers followed them even unto their own deaths, their martyrs. But when you look at what Jesus says, you see the life and their transformation that took place. It wasn't a lie. There was an empty tomb there. And these guys were willing to give their lives. All of them except John was a, was a martyr. Why? Because they believed in the empty tomb. They believed in the risen Savior. This morning, you're here just like the other day when I told the guy, this is a divine appointment. This is your divine appointment. This is your time where Jesus says, I want to meet you. I want to have a relationship with you. Every sin that you've ever committed was put on me on the cross. And my blood will cleanse you. No more guilt, no more punishment, no more shame, nothing. Amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed. So much for being a part of our online streaming. I hope you really enjoyed the message today. And I want you to just take it to heart. Whatever the Lord has spoken to you, just take it to heart. And, and I pray that if you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that today would be that day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So that's what we're praying for you. And if you're wondering, how do I get to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Well, let me tell you, it's pretty simple. First of all, Jesus loves you more than anybody on this planet. So let me tell you, he's wanting you to know him. So as you come to him, we recognize, one, that we've sinned against God. Everybody has. The Bible says that all have sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. Well, we recognize that one. We don't have to be told that. We know that. The second thing is, it says that God demonstrated his love for us, and that's you. God loves you even though that we were sinners. That's how much he cares for you. So you got to get it out of the way. He's not judging you. He already sent his son to die in our place so that we could have all of our sin placed upon him. And then we believe we had faith in him that that's what he did. And he did it because he loved us. The Bible says the wages of our sin is death. Well, Jesus took our death sentence for us. But then it doesn't leave it as a negative. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. It's not works. It's not a, a church membership somewhere. It's not giving money to somebody. All of those are good things, but this not, does not bring salvation. So now, how do you get there? It's only in Jesus. So simply just open your heart and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me. I want to turn away from all the stupid stuff that I'm doing. And I want to turn to you. I want you to be my Lord, my Savior, the boss of my life. And Jesus, come in and save me. I want to love you. I want to live for you. I want to obey your word all the days of my life. And that's what you can do. Pray that prayer right now. And I'll tell you, Jesus is waiting. And the moment, the instant you do that, 
you will be saved. And my encouragement to you, find a great Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Get connected. Now, if you're in the Houston area, man, we would love to have you at Fellowship of the Nations. But if you're in different parts of the country or, or even around the world, find somewhere that they're preaching Jesus. And I promise you, it will change your life. Hope you can join us again next week. And uh, up until then, we'll be praying for you. Pray for us. We'd love to hear from you. Just go on our website, FOTN.org, Fellowship of the Nations, and let us hear from you. God bless you.